excuse me. Uh, thanks for coming out. You people didn't want to ask Dries questions? No? All right, I appreciate it. This is a hard time slot. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my name's David Moore. I'm a Drupal developer at NPR. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? Um, <clears throat> as I just said, I'm a developer. I'm going to tell you again, and you will definitely get the point by the end of this hour that I am a developer. And this is going to come from a developer's point of view. I'm not a product owner, or a scrum master, an ops guy. Uh, and so uh, just you've been warned. And uh, keep that in mind as I'm talking. That's, that. That, that's the lens through which I look at these problems. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my experience uh, with Core Publisher. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. I was on the Core Publisher project for three and a half years. I'm on a new project now as of January, which still involves Drupal, I'm happy to say. Uh, but I learned a lot of things over those three and a half years and uh, have tried to distill them down into an hour's talk and uh, hopefully you can get something out of it. Now, this is more of an abstract sort of general talk about building a Drupal team, uh, building a big Drupal project, uh, things like that. It is not sort of a nuts and bolts what's under the hood of Core Publisher. Um, if you're interested in that, I, it's still very interesting, uh, but it is very specific. If you need to know how to build a public media specific platform starting on Drupal 7 Alpha, uh, there is a talk out there and I've given it before and you can email me and I can send you a link. Uh, but I thought I'd do something a little more general and hopefully it'd be a little more useful. Not too abstract, but not too detailed. Um, this might seem like a strange thing. I'm assuming everyone here has heard of, knows of NPR. Yes? All right. Um, there is some nuance here, though, that, that, that often gets overlooked. We are not, just so you know, we're not a uh, government entity. We're not a government radio station. We don't have really anything directly to do with radio stations. What we do is we produce content, um, and your local uh, independent public radio station uh, purchases that content and then plays it over the airwaves. Um, In a, um, you can also get the content obviously through NPR.org. Any regular users of NPR.org out here? So we, we are, you know, obviously to produce this content, we need to be a big news organization. Um, but I'm just bringing this up because I get a lot of, uh, there's, there's some ambiguity there and it's oftentimes intentional because the NPR brand is so powerful, it behooves a local station to say, this is your NPR station. And what that really means is we purchase an awful lot of content from NPR, and you hear NPR content an awful lot on us. Um, you hear that especially during pledge time. Um, anyway, that, that's who NPR is. What's Core Publisher? Um, it is our, um, like I said, we provide content to public radio stations, but we also provide services. Digital services, that's the name of the division I work for. We're based in Boston, um, not DC, where the rest of, most of the rest of NPR is located. Uh, started in 2010, it is a turnkey solution. So most public radio stations, as you can imagine, as I just alluded to, uh, have to beg for money. Um, they do not have huge uh, tech staffs on hand. Um, some of the bigger ones do, BUR and WNYC, uh, KQED. Uh, but for a mid-market or small-market radio station, um, they just don't have the, the means to do a lot of digital um, outreach. And so we provide that uh, with Core Publisher. Uh, it was built on a Drupal 7 Alpha. If anyone went to uh, Schnitzel's talk yesterday, uh, Amazie Labs built their, relaunched their website on Drupal 8 Alpha. And he used the word crazy and insane uh, multiple times. And I'm not going to disagree with him. Uh, do not try to build a big project on uh, Drupal 7 Alpha. I learned a ton about core and all sorts of stuff in Drupal 7, but it was a very rocky ride. In fact, it was on, when we launched, we started building on an Alpha, we launched live on a beta fall of uh, 2010, and I think there was about six pilot sites when it actually went to 7.0. So don't try this at home. Uh, there's now pushing, I think that's a little high on the estimate, but pushing 150 different stations using it. It's one big multi-site. It obviously has a lot of bells and whistles for public media, particularly radio, but some TV. Um, and the biggest thing is integration with the NPR API. Uh, as I mentioned prior, 
NPR is a very large uh, news organization that, that creates an awful lot of content. Some of it you hear on the radio, some of it you see on NPR.org. And we also have an API uh, that draws that content out and places it in your, your, your local uh, public radio uh, website. So a very small station can have a very good looking website that pull every morning automatically pulls good, fresh, original NPR content onto their homepage. Um, and that's, as you can imagine, that's a real attraction. So, four easy steps if you're about to build a big Drupal project. Piece of cake. Build a strong team. That's, this seems pretty obvious, right? If you don't have a good team, you're going nowhere. And we're going to talk a lot about building that, hiring, building a good team. Everyone needs to be on the same page. That is crucial. Um, notice <clears throat> it says keep developers happy and motivated. I'm going to include front end guys as developers and uh, maybe designers too if I'm in a good mood. Uh, but that's the core of your team. If your core of your team is not happy and motivated, um, things are going to fizzle out. You're not going to get that great product out. And if you get the first three bullet points, the fourth should follow um, relatively stress free, right? So as I said, First and foremost, you don't have a team, you want a team. Uh, Jeff Bezos, um, who I think is probably, you could, might probably have opinions about him, but he seems like a pretty smart guy. Um, I probably wrenched this rule completely out of context, but I like it. The two pizza rule, how big should your team be? Can you feed them with two pizzas? Um, I know things are bigger in Texas, but up in Boston, a large pie is like, yay. Uh, eight sort of medium-sized slices, two large pizzas, 16 medium-sized slices. Uh, it's about six people. Um, similarly, when we're talking about keeping things consistent at NPR and the core publisher team, uh, we went through a lot of different uh, phases, a small team, a medium-sized team, two pretty big teams, one enormous team, uh, and now uh, they're back to one sort of tight two-pizza team, and that seems to be what's working best. Um, you know, keeping things consistent, it's, it's important to have the same people working on the same code base for as long as possible, getting to know each other, um, getting to know how each other works. The more sort of cohesive unit you have, um, the more productive things are going to be. Be patient when hiring. You know, uh, they talk about fail fast in the startup world. Don't, don't do that with hiring. Um, take the time. And I'm sure if you're looking for, to hire or um, looking for a job uh, here, especially here at DrupalCon, you've heard people saying, Everyone's hiring, and there's no good Drupal developers. And there's more than a little bit of truth to that, but still you got to be patient. If you make a, a bad hire, especially a bad key hire, and don't realize it until six months in, uh, your project is, is going to falter. Um, and you got to start with a hub. Now, what on earth is a hub? Hub is your lead developer, is the man or woman um, who stirs the drink on that project. Um, they need to be good and they need to be experienced at Drupal, and I think those are two different things, okay? Um, they need to have been in the Drupal world for a while and understood the community and the idioms, and they also need to code well. But more than that, they need to be a leader. They need to be someone who's respected by the other people on the team, people look up to, who, um, who knows how to lead. You know, you can find a very good Drupal developer out there who is just a little too introverted, uh, a little too thin-skinned, it's not going to work. You need to vet the hub. You need to find out if this hub, this man or woman, is everything they say they are. Now, it's sort of a catch-22. If you don't have a hub already, how do you know this person is that good? Do whatever it takes. You know, hire Acquia to, to pour through their code. Hire some consultant that you trust to go in and, and say thumbs up or thumbs down on this guy. Again, be patient. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world if you start with a great lead developer. And, and give that developer real authority. Don't just throw them to the junior developers and say, this guy's good, uh, do what he says. You know, allow him to actually veto things, to say, give him the ability to say, that commit's no good, roll it back, or don't merge that branch, it's not ready. Um, things like that. You've got a hub, you need uh, some spokes. And spokes are the, uh, the junior and mid-level developers that uh, complement the lead developer and the designers and the front-end guys. 
Um, I thought about all the adjectives used to describe developers that I like and respect and think are very good at their job, and I kept on coming to these two, two, two points. They're passionate, they're enthusiastic, they love coding, they code in their spare time, and they're also very careful and cautious and thoughtful. They're fastidious. There's lots of good coders out there that are too sloppy, and there's <clears throat> lots of very careful coders out there that are a little overly cautious and sort of get paralyzed and move very slowly and don't write that code that well. So you need both. You need a breadth of skills these days. Um, front end, they need to at least some experience with the front end. They need to be able to be knowledgeable about markup and CSS, jQuery and JavaScript. You know, they don't need to know all the ins and outs of CSS3, but they need to be familiar with it at least. Uh, some DevOps, the line, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in infrastructure. The line between uh, operations and code, especially in Drupal, gets blurrier and blurrier. And the more they can help out with deployment scripts and moving things around, the better. They should be able to write a little bit of bash. And not Drupal. Um, the, uh, the phrase that Larry Garfield Krell coined a couple of years ago, get off the island, which you might have heard this week, um, that's even more important. It's good to see Drupal 8 seriously getting off the island with all the, uh, with all the symphony and other things in it. Um, if they only know Drupal, I think that's a little bit of a red flag. You know, they got to know, you know, any signs of playing with other frameworks, other languages is always a good thing. And what do they do from 6 to 8? I just alluded to this, but, you know, do they have hobby sites? Do they have stuff on GitHub that's totally unrelated to Drupal? Um, the last point is, is sort of obvious, you know, um, start with just pouring over what code they have available. This is the the incredible advantage of hiring an open source developer is everything is or should be public. And so you can go over, um, you can look at so much of their code and really get a good grasp. It's a good way to weed out things. Um, other ways to weed out people. Um, you know, I get questions all the time like, what's a killer interview question? What's a really specific, like, if I'm using the form API on a multi-step form and what should this pound whatever be? Like, That's ridiculous. No one knows that stuff off the top of their head. Everyone Googles that. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, it's much better in my mind to ask more generalized questions. You're going to know much more about the person um, if you ask, these are what, one, two, three, four, five crucial things that just sort of ask, not even a question, like, tell me what you think about technical debt. You know, tell me, tell me what, how, how do you do version control? And if you get any kind of faltering around these, that might be a red flag. I mean, it, no one likes writing, no developer likes writing tests, but if they say, I don't write tests because my code's great and it doesn't need to be tested, or I don't write tests, I do it all manually, that's a red flag. Uh, version control, this is, I've actually heard this, um, someone said, I, I don't do version control because I don't work with other people, or I don't do version control because if you write it right the first time, you don't need version control. Like, these are serious red flags. So this is, these are just great ways to very easily just, you know, weed out people. Um, I'm going to talk a little more about interviews, which, which might seem a little weird and obvious, but I think most tech shops and most companies, they're doing interviews wrong. Um, I'm going to explain. Uh, the bad interview is also the typical interview, right? You, you sit in a room, you're bombarded with questions. They're either overly specific or overly broad. Um, there's very little give and take. It's just, and it's an interrogation. It's 45 minutes by a developer who doesn't, isn't really a stakeholder, doesn't have a whole lot of skin in the game, and just wants to go to lunch. Um, that is a bad interview, and, and, and like I said, that is the typical interview, I think, these days. It's unfortunate. Here, my radical solution is, this is what I think is the great interview for a developer. Um, and I've done this once before. I've been on this interview before, and it was by far the best interview I've ever had, hands down. Um, <clears throat> bring the person in, bring the candidate in, buy them lunch, at the very least buy them lunch, buy them a beer at the end, too. Um, and so take an existing module that you have that's fairly simple, show them what it looks like, and say, can you reverse engineer this? Take all the time you want. It's completely open book. We're going to put your code up on the screen. So it's, it's completely uh, conversational. You can ask questions of us. We'll ask questions of you. We just want to know the process. We want to know how you code. I don't care that you're Googling really simple Drupal functions. I do that. I'm not embarrassed by that. I can't keep that all in my head. Um, now, the common reaction to this is, yeah, that's a lot of time. 
So don't, first of all, don't do this with every candidate. Do this when you're down to a time, final three or two or one. And also, four hours isn't a lot of time if it means you're hiring the right, if you are much more confident about hiring the right developer. Um, I'd rather spend four hours early on than find out six months from now that this person just isn't right and, and sort of uh, passed that 45-minute interview but kind of bluffed his way through it. Um, so once you've got the team, set the ground rules. Uh, and as you'll see on my list of regrets, we didn't do enough of this at Core Publisher. And any project I do it from NPR here on in, where there's going to be a lot of assumptions and ground rules. Um, how to deal with tech debt. How are you going to deal with tech debt? I've, I've used tech debt twice now. Does everyone know what tech debt, technical debt is? You familiar with that term? Oh, not many. I'm going to completely oversimplify this, and, and, and Ward Cunningham's going to kill me for saying this, but tech debt is bad code that still works. It's not a bug because it still works, but it is an accident waiting to happen. It's a little you know, grenade with a pin in it. It drives developers crazy every time they do it. It's unmaintainable. It needs to be fixed as soon as possible. Um, it's often, uh, well, I'll talk a little more about tech debt in a second. Coding standard, that's obviously you know, the syntax, um, the agreed upon set of rules. Uh, uh, your curly braces go here, there's a space here, your comments look like this. Code reviews is having developers look at each other's code, making sure it's okay, making sure you're on the same page there. Uh, DrupalCon, I'm sure you've heard this all week, uh, this is the whole ethos of open source and Drupal is contributing your code back to the community. Snippets, uh, best practices, it doesn't just have to be modules and themes, but hopefully you're kicking that back as well. Uh, scrum rules, I'm assuming you're doing Scrum Agile. Most people are these days. Do everyone know what Scrum and Agile are? Um, again, I'm not a Scrum master. It's basically a way of working. Uh, you iterate usually over a two-week period. Uh, you plan at the beginning. Um, you work on, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Scrum in a second. Testing, how, what test suite are you going to use? How much coverage are you going to get? Things like that. And VCS is just version control system. Uh, these days, uh, especially now that Drupal.org and Drupal is on Git. Uh, you probably should be on Git too if you're not using Git. Uh, if you're not using version control, uh, Git on version control ASAP. If you're not using Git, you, you need to have a really compelling reason why not. Okay, tech debt. I'm going to sound like I'm overstating here, but I'm going to say I can't overstate this. I feel like I should take off my shoe and bang it on the podium here. <laughs> tech debt will kill you in your project. It will just absolutely destroy developers' morale and motivation. Uh, by its very nature, it's, it's sort of viral and self-replicating. Uh, you often see the broken windows theory from sociology or anthropology um, to use to describe that. And what that means is um, if a developer goes, is looking at existing code and sees some bad code, some hacks, some shortcuts, some laziness, he'll say, oh, that's okay to do that. I guess I'm going to do it here as well. And suddenly you have twice as much tech debt in your module than you did yesterday. Um, yeah, I, it, it absolutely, in, if you don't have a firm plan uh, to deal with it, first step is to document it. Know that it is tech debt, right? Say, okay, we need to get this out tomorrow, but this is tech debt. This is a shortcut. We need to fix this as soon as possible. Go back to the wiki and document it. Write a ticket in your ticketing system saying we need to fix this ASAP. Um, have maintenance packs and trigger deals. So um, true story, on, a, on another project, it wasn't core publisher, it was a side project we were doing. I literally made a pinky swear with the product owner and said, if we get a fifth radio station on this product, we have to write a UI. We're not writing configuration and code anymore. Um, the sad part is that the project got spiked before we got to five radio stations. But I felt very confident, and I kept on reminding her that, you know, we did this pinky square. I felt confident that we would, we would deal with that tech debt if we had to. Coding standard. Uh, I can talk about this all day and all night. This is probably my biggest passion. Um, the good news is Drupal has an existing coding standard that's pretty exhaustive. Uh, 90, I say 97, that's a pretty good number. 97% of the time, if your two developers have a dispute about uh, 
a, bra a bracket, a comment, a space, something like that. Just go to the coding standard. End of discussion. And and I, the the developers I work with on, used to work with on Core Publisher, we actually had a good time about this. We'd go racing over to the co coding standard and say, I think I'm right. No, I'm right. And someone's right and someone's wrong. It's pretty black and white. Um, and this is another talk I give, another another talk I give that I can, am very passionate about is I would highly encourage you to go well beyond the Drupal coding standard. So uh, look at common idioms and design patterns in your code and codify those and say, and create basically create a style guide for your code. Um, you know, always we, we say, we have a saying uh, in the core publishing team, uh, WWCD, what would core do? If it's not spelled out in the coding standard, then we look, is there an example in core, which isn't always the best, like core is not super consistent, but it should provide you with some guidelines. And if you start writing these guidelines down, um, uh, the more, the fewer debates you're going to have on your team and uh, the cleaner and more maintainable and predictable your code's going to be. Um, like I said, I have a whole other talk about this. I like to talk about how Drupal's cookie cutter code. Like, I love coding Drupal, but 70, 80 percent of it is very rote, you know. Um, I, need, I need a page, okay, that's a hook menu. But only certain people can see this page. That's a hook permission. There's, there's, it's black and white. Like, just do that. <laughs> There's no alternate way of doing that. And then, if you, the more you routinize these things, I think that's a word, I'm pretty sure, anyway. Uh, the more you make these routine, the more time you'll have for like the really fun stuff, the really creative stuff where there is no black and white answer. Code reviews. Um, we, well, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll do the big reveal about regrets later on, but, um, not only is this, your, your, your developers have to be looking at the code base as a whole and they have to be looking at it in real time as other developers commit new code to the code base. Um, and it's not just good to have sort of another set of eyes so it's more consistent and whatnot. It's just a great learning experience because you learn things as you look at other people's code. And you also interact more with your other developers. You get to know them better. It does require a baseline of respect, which again, if you've done hiring right, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, if, if, if you can't get developers to look at each other's code because they're too proud or they're too thin-skinned, uh, they're too defensive, eee, that's indicative of, you've got an iceberg there. <laughs> you've got bigger problems underneath the surface. Uh, also, if, if they can't do it with like a, a, a modicum of fun, that might be a problem as well. Like, Honestly, when I was on the core publisher team with, with the, the last iteration of developers, I, I loved doing code review. And, and we would give each other uh, a fair amount of grief, but we had that baseline of respect that no one took it personally. And, and we learned so much, you know? Um, you know, you, you need to be um, a mixture of confident, but also a little bit humble, not, and, and not thinking you know everything. Kicking code back. Okay, and I talked about how this is the, the whole driving force of open source and Drupal. Um, the more you can kick back, the better your code's going to be. You know, if I'm just writing a one-off custom module, it's going to be a little sloppy. I'll admit that. If I know it's going to be on Drupal.org for any Drupal.org for anyone to see, it's going to be written a lot better, and it's also going to be sort of more Drupal-y. That's definitely a word. Don't tell me that's not a word. Um, I use that every day. It's going to be modular. Drupal is very modular. So instead of one big Uber module that does, has seven features, it's going to be broken apart into small maintainable pieces. Um, free beta testers. Well, some of the, We have not related, I'll admit, we have not released enough uh, stuff to, to Drupal.org, but the stuff we have released, people have immediately picked up on and tested and given feedback, all free of charge. And uh, to be perfectly selfish, it's really better for your resume, you know. If you walk into a job interview and say, uh, yeah, I've been doing Drupal and open source for two years. I wrote, you know, thousands of lines of code and 10,000 commits. And the hiring manager can say, well, show me. Oh, I can't. Was it is an NDA? No, we just never got around to releasing it. It's not going to help your job prospects. Um, it's much better to say, uh, this is what I did. And here you can see it. And I'm proud of it. It's nice and shiny because I know anyone can look at it at any time. Scrum Agile, so again, this is a, a, a way you work. Um, it's very common these days. Um, basically, 
you sit down at the beginning, you plan out what you're going to do for the next two weeks, you do it, uh, you regroup, you, you push the code live, and then you regroup, talk about how those two weeks went, and then start all over again. They're called sprints. Uh, again, I'm not a, a scrum master. I don't have any little certifications on my wall. Um, there's things I like about it, things I don't like about it, but mostly like it. Um, everyone I talk to out there, always they, they seem a little sheepish and say, um, well, we run a slightly modified version of Scrum. And I, I don't think you should be embarrassed by that. You know, there's all these rules and books and whatnot about this is how Scrum should run. The bottom line is, does it work or does it not work? If it's not working but the Scrum Master says you should do this, that's, that's, that's a bad idea. I was at a, a, a Scrum um, training session one time and the guy next to me uh, had a question about multiple product owners and the the, the, the certification guy said, sort of hemmed it hot and said this and that. And uh, I just wanted to step in and say, is it working? You know? If multiple products owners isn't working, dump it. Change it. You know? The fact that it's, you know, it's okay by the Scrum Master doesn't matter. Um, so what do devs, and yeah, I'm a developer. I can speak for developers, uh, or at least developers I know. Um, but I think designers and front end, and I think probably a lot of people agree with this. So you have a daily stand-up, usually at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, so it doesn't break up your day. Maybe lunchtime, that might work. It's got to be brief. You literally, it's called the stand-up because you literally stand up, which is, I think, a great idea, which ensures that it should be brief. You know, you're only supposed to say three things. Uh, what did you do yesterday? What did you do? What are you doing today? Are there any blockages? Um, but it's a great way for, uh, we already think have good communication on the core publisher team, but it's a great way if you're not paying attention uh, or you're out that day or you're, you're buried in your code to say, oh, that guy's working on that? You're having a problem with that? I remember that. You know, there's some tech debt there. Or I know how to fix that. Um, another great thing about Scrum is, is tickets, manageable tickets. You write out a task, a very explicit task, um, and task actually has a, specific meaning in Scrum, I know, I know, but bear with me. Uh, you write out a ticket that I, I want to add this feature, or I want to fix this bug, and developers love that. You know, give me tunnel vision, that's all I'm working on right now. And in a broader sense, you have sanctity of the sprint as well, which what that means is unless something is on fire, on fire, <laughs> new tickets don't get added to the existing sprint. You have some priority, it better be, you know, a, a site needs to be broken before we interrupt the sprint. Come back to me in two weeks at the end of the sprint. Um, and that, again, that, that is, it sounds confining, but it's really liberating to a developer to be, hey, I'm free. I'm not worrying that someone's going to run in and, and, and break my flow and give me some stupid task that really does not need to be done this week. Uh, clear prioritization of issues which is important. When you do your planning, you can see what's happening this week, what's important, what's not, what's got bumped down. And the retro, as I mentioned, at the end of your sprint, usually in you know, two weeks, you sit down and you have an airing of the grievances, basically, or a celebration of the successes of what's happened in those past two weeks. Uh, and again, looking for warning signs. Uh, if you have everyone sitting there, like, looking at their fingernails for two weeks, that's not a good sign. It means they're not communicating, honestly. Because uh, there's no way something didn't happen in those two weeks, either good or bad. Um, uh, by the same token, if everyone is yelling and screaming every single retro, that obviously, I don't have to tell you this, but that's not a good sign. Um, but, but if it happens a couple times a year, once a quarter, I think that's probably a decent sign, you know? It's, it's you guys are working on hard stuff with deadlines. People make mistakes. People check out for a week. People are... are um, preoccupied with something at home maybe, like there's going to be problems. And, and as long as you're communicating honestly, um, I think that's a good way to go with the retro. What don't they love? Um, as I mentioned before, blindly following procedures, you know, saying, hey, we have to use this tool to manage our tickets because we've always done it that way, or hey, this is exactly the way Sprint, you know, this is the way Agile says we have to do things even though no one likes it, and it doesn't make any sense, we still have to do it this way. Uh, similarly, uh, people, particularly on the product side, who don't get, you know, warrant developers, they might see Agile and their, you know, their eyes light up and say, oh, this means we can, if it works on the screen during the demo, that means we can push it to a live server, right? And the no, 
no, no, no, no. This is a proof of concept. Uh, we have a saying, uh, a POC, proof of concept, uh, plus a live server is a POS. Um, and uh, it's very true. Um, you know, it, uh, people also just hear the word agile and think, oh, that means we can jump from project to project. And it, it's, just, it, it's just a messy way to do things, you know. The developers can tell you when things are ready, when tests have been written, when it's passing tests, when there's little to no technical debt, and that's when things should go live. Uh, word or two about architecture. Um, when I was uh, asking for advice from some of the developers I worked with, uh, one of the guys said, architecture is a feature. And he was paraphrasing, I'm sure, from performance as a feature, uh, which is also true. I don't know what architecture as a feature mean, means, but I really like it. I want to write another talk about that, so no one steal that. Um, but I think what he was getting at was always, ABA, this is uh, from Glengarry Glen Ross, right? Always be architecting. Always be thinking. This goes out to developers, but, but everyone on the team. Uh, don't just develop features in, in a vacuum. You know, if you get a feature, uh, think about it and say, go back to the product owner and say, uh, this feature is too broad or this feature is too narrow. You know, if we make this feature a little more abstract, when the second use case comes up, which it probably is, this feature will be able to deal with that. You know, when you, when you get a feature, say, is this a standalone feature? Should I build a separate module? Or can this go into an existing module? Always thinking to be thinking about that stuff. Don't abstract things too much, but don't just take the feature as is and say, okay, this is what the product owner wants, so I should build it that way. Um, small pieces loosely coupled. I wish this were my phrase, but this is all over software books and blogs and whatnot. It's especially relevant when you're building with Drupal, which is a modular system. It's always better to say, to build a, you know, one feature per module, couple them together. You can turn it off and turn it on without breaking stuff. Um, you can write, you know, write small. This is Larry Garfield. I'm channeling Larry Garfield again. Write small, manageable, testable functions. Don't write what we call God functions that do eight different things. Uh, err on the side of releasability. What do I, that's a word too, releasability. Uh, I use it every day. Uh, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> uh, I always think there's a J.D. Salinger story. I want to say it's Franny and Zoe. Uh, it has these deep theological impl impl implications. Uh, but at the end of the story, one character is telling the other character, Shine your shoes, even if you know no one's going to see your shoes, right? That's the same thing with your code. Write your code as if it is going to be on the homepage of Drupal.org, even if you know it isn't. It's just such a good practice to get into. It's always easier to just push a button that says release rather than say, Ooh, oh, man, do I have to tidy this up. Um, and also, um, you're going to see this in my list of regrets, but we, again, we... we we're building on an alpha, so we, we did have to write an awful lot of custom code early on. Um, but there are times when, you know, your first choice should be a contrib module. Product owner says, I want this feature. Say, okay, well, we have this, you know, a good, I should say, a good, well-maintained contrib module that's not an alpha. I guess that goes without saying. You can say, okay, I want this feature. Say, okay, we have this contrib module. It's get you 80% of the way there. Is that good enough? No. Don't then go back to writing custom, but say, is there sort of a shim layer? Is there a tiny little, uh, you know, 100-line module I can write that interacts with that contrib module that does what it should do? That should be, that should be your priority list. Contrib, contrib plus a tiny bit of custom, and then only as a last resort custom. Every module gets a real true API. This is... Uh, this is another 45-minute talk, um, and it's really just aimed at developers. But what's it, what it means is uh, every module should have easily uh, accessible functions that other modules and Drush can use. Again, this is a um, – I was inspired by Larry Garfield, who gave a great talk about – was given a great talk about this several times. Um, you're, you're, you should not be cramming all your functionality and business logic into a hook submit, uh, into any kind of hook, a hook cron. They should be, your, your, your Drupal function should be calling other functions. Um, work with Drupal. This is my most abstract point, so please bear with me on this. Um, Drupal is a CMS. This is a long-standing debate. No, it's a framework. No, it's a CMS. No, it's both. 90%, 95% of the time, you're going to be using Drupal 
as a CMS. You're going to take the minimal or the uh, standard profile, copy that, or just use it out of the box and modify it. You're going to be using the Drupal admin panels and forms. Um, it's a CMS. As such, your approach to it should be extend and theme rather than I'm going to build this from the ground up. And, and let me give you an example because this is kind of abstract. Okay, this is, uh, this is a screenshot from the, the current project I'm working on. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that, but it's, it's a very basic um, Drupal UI. Um, and it, it doesn't really matter what I'm doing. It, you need to, I'm modifying certain objects in a third-party API, but I want to use it, I want to make a user-friendly version of this. That's all it's doing. Uh, but as you can see, it doesn't look great. And it doesn't look great, especially when I take a screenshot of the, of the, of the Drupal 7, 7 theme. Um, you know, you've got your uh, ad group that's called an action link. That's not incredibly intuitive. You've got the weird striping. Uh, you've got a lot of trapped white space. Um, you've got edit, delete, and the, the links say edit and delete. Um, if I'm a product owner and my developer comes back with something like this and I'm not fully immersed in Drupal and understand that Drupal's a CMS and not a framework, I might say, oh, you know what? I'm going to give this to the developer and he's going to make a better UI. That's not part of the ticket, though. This is what the UI organically comes up with, and, and this is the, you're following existing. Here, I go back on the slide. Uh, you're following what did I say? Pre-existing, well-worn core patterns. So when you go back to this, um, you write a separate ticket that says, "I'm not wild about the admin theme. Particularly, I'm not wild about the trapped white space and the and the and the the, the zebra stripes." and the trapped white space and the action links and all that stuff. That's what you say, and it's a completely separate ticket. It has nothing to do with this UI in particular. Um, similarly, um, I, I would worry what I call comp-driven development. This is going to sound, sound like a broadside against designers. It, it really isn't. I, I love designers. I love working with them. We have some very talented designers at NPR. But if you give, if you're starting on a project and you start with a designer and say, go nuts. <laughs> Write a fully formed web page. Um, give me a comp back. It's inevitable that that person is going to put in inherent information architecture and features and all sorts of stuff, which if they're not working with developers as they're, as they're doing this, it's you're sort of, you know, the, the developers have to then reverse engineer all this stuff based off of a PDF. And, and things can get really strange and sloppy, and, and, and I have a real use case of that. But... Um, Keep that in mind. You know, Drupal's a CMS. Think extend. Think theme. Don't think, I have this feature. I want to see what this feature looks like from top to bottom. I want this UI to look different from, from the, uh, the other core UIs. Uh, a few notes on infrastructure. Um, again, I'm not an ops guy. I knew very little about ops uh, when I got there four years ago. I know a lot more, but I still know very, very little. Um, did anyone go to the caching session, the two-hour caching session yesterday? Uh, it was kind of detailed. It was amazing. I can't believe what these guys pulled off uh, in two hours. Really, really valuable. Uh, you should know this even if you have no technical skills at all, but Drupal is very expensive. It takes up a lot of um, uh, memory and processing power. Um, you need to start caching ASAP. If you're running a uh, multi-site uh, and you have like five pilot sites, that's about the max you want to get to before you start thinking about caching. Uh, if you have a big Drupal project, do not go live without many, many uh, layers of caching. Um, it's just imperative. Your, your site will go down so fast. Similarly, this is uh, front-end performance, you know, big images, huge JavaScript files, you got to keep those in check uh, at the beginning or else it's, it's basically another form of technical debt. Fortunately, 10 years ago, I'm uh, sorry, four years ago, 2010, that was a bigger problem. 2014, now people think mobile first all the time, so they're thinking, you know, very lightweight websites from the beginning, which is nice to see. So that's less of a problem. Uh, as I said before, the line between ops and uh, code gets blurrier and blurrier. Um, the more you... Uh, as a developer, can write bash and uh, glue code and whatnot and help out ops, uh, the happier they're going to be. And this, this goes without saying as well, but um, 
it's good to be able to write these bash scripts and stuff, but the more you can automate and outsource. Nagios, we use Nagios to make sure our servers are up in the middle of the night. Uh, uh, Agar, which we don't use, we built our own Agar, but again, that's another talk. Uh, that allows non-technical people to deploy sites. New Relic for monitoring performance. Um, if your site's kind of sluggish, you can go to New Relic. These all cost money and time and everything, but <clears throat> I'd much rather get a ping in the middle of the night from Nagios saying, hey, this site is, might be down, can you do something about it, than getting a ping 45 minutes later from a general manager who you know, has our VP's personal cell phone number saying, hey, the site's down. Uh, Jenkins for various levels of automation. Um, all kind of standard stuff, but stuff you need to be thinking pretty much from day one. Again, being all being on the same page. Uh, advice for product owners. Um, Again, I'm not a product owner, um, and this is advice I've given to product owners I know, I think. Um, this first point actually is something that our product owner came up with, and I, I find it incredibly valuable. And she's actually asked us to repeat this phrase to us when she seems to be straying from it. And what do I mean by that? Uh, provide the dev team with problems. So when you write a ticket for a feature, it should say something like, as KUT, which is the one of the local Austin radio stations, as KUT, this is weird. Um, this is how issues are written in Scrum, if you don't know. As KUT, I would like to have a list of local stories on my homepage. There's not any local stuff. It's all national. That's the way to write that ticket. That's the problem. Don't write it as, as KUT, I would like a view with the following parameters on my homepage in a block with the weight of such and such. That's for the developers and the front-end guys and the designers to figure out. And again, it, it, it provides a nice, clear line of distinction of, of what the product owner should contribute and what the team as a whole should contribute. Uh, be a leader, not a dictator, um, probably goes without saying. The first time you say to your team, you ask for something kind of out of the blue with no really good explanation, you're going to start to lose people and lose respect. Communicate or over-communicate. You notice under-communicate is not an option here. Um, I, I feel like I'm giving you... Uh, the top five number one pet peeves of developers. Like, well, I only have one pet peeve as a developer, but there's five of them, right? Uh, but one of them is definitely getting sandbagged in the middle of a meeting with some bizarre request or feature, you know, some bizarre feature request that comes out of the middle of nowhere with no good explanation. You know, if we know that's coming a couple weeks ahead of time, if we see that in planning, it, it's much easier to, uh, to A, argue against it, and B, be ready for it. <clears throat> Stay focused. I've touched on this a couple times now. It's it's tempting to say, oh, wow, well, this is, you know, there's a, a nice shiny new toy over here. I think we should start working on this. Or, hey, let's do uh, let's do a responsive theme, but at the same time, let's cut down on tech debt. Uh, but at the same time, let's build up, um, uh, you know, a, a, a TV API at the same time. Like, stay focused. Um, the developers are going to like you a lot more for it. And <clears throat> stay positive. You're a leader, and this goes out to the to the dev lead as well. Um, stay positive. Don't stay positive to the point of insincerity because people can smell it a mile away. If things are bad, admit that things are bad and talk about how to make things good. But, uh, you know, don't be a grump just because you're feeling grumpy, uh, basically. It's, you know, people will follow your lead. If, if, you, um, if you show low morale, then the developers will follow. Okay, so the... Um, <clears throat> The talk summary promised a uh, short, I think I said a short list of regrets. It's a little longer than I expected. Uh, so I, I have to deliver on this. Uh, this, is, this is sort of the practical stuff. You probably could have guessed this from the first, uh, whatever, 45 minutes of this talk. Um, it, all this stuff basically boils down to I feel really good about where Core Publisher is today. Uh, I'm happy to be doing something different after three and a half years, but I think it's, it's in a good place right now. It's a huge project, so there's always going to be tech debt. There's always going to be bugs. Uh, but it's in a much better place than it was before. I just wish we'd come to a lot of this stuff sooner rather than later, basically. And so, like I said, I think at the beginning, um, th these are lessons for you as well as lessons for NPR. The next time we start a project, I think we want to go down this checklist and say, you know, uh, what's our plan to deal with tech debt? Uh, what's our plan to deal with testing? 
coding standard? Who's going to enforce the coding standard? Um, how are we going to treat this? Uh, what's, our, what's our process on grabbing custom code versus contrib? Uh, like I said before, are we going to do this on, you know, early, early adapters are early adopters. Um, we had to make so many changes because we did this on an alpha. It might have behooved us to wait a little bit. And we stayed on the island a little too much. Um, we started, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to get this wrong. Drupal, uh, we picked up a hammer that was Drupal and then everything we looked at was a nail, basically. Um, sometimes that was good, sometimes not so good. Um, we uh, <clears throat> focused a little too much on Drupal, basically. Um, this is my, this is my touchy-feely uh, finale, uh, but I think it's important. Uh, might have been a little negative there, so I want to end on a high note. Uh, we live in a, a fascinating time. It's eerie and creepy, I admit, uh, but it's fascinating, and it's, it's nice to be part of the fascinating thing, things that are going on, you know, uh, uh, driverless cars, solar-powered roads. Has everyone watched the solar-powered roads video on YouTube? Google it. There's, there's two different ones. There's like a nuts and bolts one, and then there's a, uh, a more fun one. But it, uh, it, it'll make you feel a lot more hopeful about the future and about technology and uh, make you want to wake up in the morning. I don't know about you, but I, I get to do my hobby as a well-paying job. I don't know a lot of people that get to do that. And um, it's a real privilege. And never take that for granted. I mean, it's really, and especially working in public radio, which is something I love and I listen to every day. Um, you know, I have friends and coworkers who, have the whole TGIF vibe. And it's not like I don't really enjoy spending time with my friends and family on the weekends, but I don't dread Monday morning either. So don't take that for granted, you know. If things are going bad on your team, take a step back and take a deep breath and remember that you get to do something really great every day. Um, this third point I almost put in the PO slide, but it really is for everyone. Stay humble and curious. You're right, I don't know. I was wrong. Those are the three most important things you can say at a stand-up, at a retro, at planning. Don't be so thin-skinned and defensive. You know, don't be overconfident. You will gain so much more respect if you stop to your product owner and say, yeah, you're right, I was wrong there. That person will respect you so much more. And uh, I don't know, you know, I'm a, uh, like a lot of people out there, I think I'm a pretty good develop Drupal developer, but I'm also self-taught like most uh, I'm a former, you know, uh, theology major who's pretty good at math. That's basically, you know, my backstory. I know nothing about hardware. I know nothing about CS. I knew very little about servers until I started at NPR. Um, I asked my boss and my director of ops the most naive questions. But I know they respect me. And they'll give me, they'll make fun of me, but in a, in a good-natured and respectful way. You know, say, it's, it's perfectly fine to say, I don't know. Like, you don't know everything. No one knows everything. Um, any fans of The Wire out there? All right. So <clears throat> if you want to know more, Google this last phrase. You'll see a little clip. Um, as much as I talk about hiring people who uh, do development as a hobby and uh, are working uh, from six to eight, don't let it consume you. I mean, it's great, and I love it, and, and I'm obsessed with it, but it doesn't consume me. Uh, the video is uh, the, the video clip from The Wire. It's, I'm sure it's not safe for work. Uh, but it's all about Lester Freeman, who's a good cop and dedicated cop, but he has a girlfriend, and he makes dollhouse furniture, and he has a life outside of the job, and he just is giving it to McNulty, who's a womanizing alcoholic who has nothing besides the job, giving him full barrel, saying, the job will not save you, Jimmy. You know, so um, go outside, you know, and see your friends and family, and um, take some time off, have a beer and enjoy yourself. And that's me. Uh, if you want to talk about Drupal, if you want to follow me on Twitter, um, I talk about nothing except this stuff on Twitter, basically. Um, which is good. I, I don't talk about food. I don't talk about my daughter. I don't talk about anything except Drupal minutia, basically, and tech debt and whatnot. So if you're into that, I'm a good person to follow. Uh, if you something, want something more casual, then don't. <laughs> Um, if you want to talk Drupal, that's my email address. Um, there's the, if you want to comment on this talk, please do. There's the link. There's no way you're going to write that down. You can probably find that easily enough uh, on the uh, Austin uh, DrupalCon site. Uh, we are 
if you're a developer, I believe we still have one more position open, Boston-based. Uh, if you know anyone who's Boston-based or you're Boston-based, it's more of a general web generalist job. It's less Drupal. I think it would start, I don't know, I'm not doing the hiring at all, so I wouldn't know about it, but I, I think it's more, um, we're looking for someone with Node or willing to learn Node. Um, so come see me, I'll give you a card. And uh, that's about it. Right, we have seven minutes for questions. You want to, can you get up the, the mic? Uh, maybe while we're waiting for him. Uh, great talk. I think perspective and humility are, are very often lacking in this industry, and I think that's, it's good to promote those principles. Um, sort of being a little bit newer to Drupal and, and adopting it, I'm uh, also doing a lot of web application work in our agency. Curious about your comments on Drupal. Don't treat Drupal as a framework. It's a CMS, and there, there's boundaries. Uh, what, in your experience, are those boundaries? And how would, uh, you know, given your experience the last four or five years, what would you have done differently when you start to hit those edges of where Drupal's not a framework? Um, yeah, this is, like I said, this is some of the, that's the more sort of abstract and not fully fleshed out. And I have, like, two really good examples, but I don't have enough good examples to, to really write like a whole talk and treatise about it. Uh, but it does go back to, um, you know, uh, if we could travel back in time, and, and I, I think it should come clear in this talk that I have, I have the greatest respect for our core publisher uh, product owner. But uh, she didn't know a lot about Drupal. She came from a, a different sort of, uh, I think, Dreamweaver-y kind of background. And so it was the, the, it was, uh, the thought was, we need this feature. Let's comp it out first with a design and then build it as opposed to, um, because it's harder to, it's easy to write a comp, or to, 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 to drop a comp. It's much harder to, to make a list of sort of features and whatnot. Um, it's much more abstract, but if you do it that way, like I said, the UI and everything sort of organically comes up. You know, if, if you, the more sort of generalized the task, the, the, the feature, say, um, uh, I want this, and then your Drupal experts can come in and say, oh, you know what, that's a view. And that's a block, and we're going to give it this weight, and we're going to put it here. Um, again, I, I, um, it's hard for me to. The, the real example is uh, when Core Publisher started out as a, as a uh, it first started out, first iteration was something called News Destination, which was a, um, it was just a very, very simple reverse cron block, a river of news. And we, we, we didn't have views yet, we didn't have features yet, um, but we needed this. And, might have made sense to do it in WordPress, off the record. Well, this is being recorded, damn. Um, <laughs> but we started with a comp, which was bad, because there was all these weird things that got a comp. We started with like two modules and a theme instead of five or six smaller, more discrete modules and a theme, you know? Um, uh, we did too much custom work, which again, early on, we were really, our, our hand was forced. And at the time, I argued that we didn't need views because our, our, uh, our query was so simple. It really is just give me everything, paginate it. Um, but we it took us forever until we actually did move over to views when views was available. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. It, it's it's, it's um, uh, uh, work with the designers early on. Grab as much custom as possible. Make sure your product owner understands that it's better to grab a custom mod. Like, Give us a very, very abstract idea of what you want, and then let's look at Contrib. Let's browse through Contrib. There's, what, 20,000? There's an insane number of modules. Like, something's got to get you most of the way there. And either you're okay with that, or we write a shim layer. So that's, uh, I, I can probably talk more about that, but uh, if you want to talk later. But that's, those are my general thoughts off the top of the head. Thank you. More questions? So knowing what you know after three and a half years of building Composer, which is awesome, by the way, we use it, um, as I mentioned before, on our sites, would you have still built it in Drupal if you could go back? Yeah, that's like the, <laughs> Well, as I was talking to my coworkers and trying to get ideas about this talk, uh, there was the question, am I going back in time to 2010 or am I starting right now in 2014? So there's things... I'd still do it in Drupal, yeah. Um, 
like I alluded to, some of the other sort of side iterations, news destination and some other things, we might have done in something different. But I definitely do it in Drupal. I would have waited uh, until uh, Core Publisher was, or sorry, uh, Drupal was actually stable. Drupal 7 was stable. Uh, would have used much less custom stuff, finer grained things. But yeah, I would have stuck with Drupal. I, I, I actually talking to the product owner about this. I also would have been more, and I think I just sort of said this already, been a little more uh, forceful at saying, stop treating it like a framework, right? Like, hey, we've got a module that does 80% of this. Please say you want this. You know, I know it's not how your designer drew it up, but it will save everyone time and hassle if we can just, just use a group stuff. You know, the contrib stuff. There's a lot of uh, changes I would have done in the infrastructure and um, some deep dive drush make stuff and things like that. But, but all in all, yeah. Anyone else? Last call? All right, let's go eat lunch then. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>